Hi everybody, it's Dr. Beachcomb. I'm gonna give you a cursory tutorial on uh, vintage glass fishing floats um, and just an overview. I'm not a specialist on these. I have books for you to read up on if you're interested and there's lots of websites and Facebook groups that can teach you more. But let's get started and I'll give you a little taste of one of my favorite finds on the beach. I've only found seven of these across the world. These are hard to find and they usually only show up on certain beaches. Um, but let's get started and we'll go into that later. So the original fishing floats that were used, at least in Japan, were wooden. And these were tied to nets to hold the nets up to catch the floats. They're quite beautiful. The uh, owner's names in kanji are on the floats. And the problem with these is they got waterlogged. And as they got wet, they would sink, so they wouldn't buoy up the nets. The Norwegians were the first ones to um, figure out that glass fishing floats would stay bobbing for a long period of time. And they were really the first ones in the world in the mid-1800s to start doing uh, glass fishing floats. Uh, over time, the Russians, the Portuguese, the uh, Japanese, Koreans, Chinese adopted uh, this technology. <clears throat> and these were very popular up until about this, the uh, 1960s when plastic moved in. So this, these are the kind of floats you're gonna find or buoys you're gonna find on the beach these days are the plastic. Unless you live in certain areas. Uh, the areas I'm talking about are the upper reaches of Alaska, are um, Hokkaido, Japan, uh, the Pacific Northwest occasionally, Hawaii and the Pacific Islands, sometimes in the Caribbean, sometimes in certain areas uh, in um, the UK and Europe. They come in all different sizes. You've seen the huge basketball ones, um, very, very big. You also see this kind, these are very heavy. The, the thing that differentiates working floats from um, artisan floats or tourist floats. See the bubbles in this? Look at the bubbles. Uh, and they are incredibly heavy. They have to be heavy to weather the storms and the waves and the turbulence in the oceans. But this is, this is uh, these are, aside from basketball, they come in sort of a grapefruit size. Well, that's a cannonball, a grapefruit. Baseball size is probably the most common size that you'll find, but they can even come in very, very tiny shapes and sizes. Again, see the bubbles here? These are giveaways. The swirls, the weight. Those are the markers for working glass fishing floats. You'll also find some called rolling pins in this size where the netting is wrapped around these and they're tied to the nets that way. So rolling pins are a harder, um, uh, flow to find, but not impossible. Uh, you go to Hokkaido, Japan, in the backyards, you're gonna find these everywhere. They've never been used in the ocean, but they were made and designed to be used by working fishing fleets. Sadly, I don't have any Norwegian floats to show you. I wish I did, um, but I can show you some of the other ones that um, are, are quite popular. Uh, right now, the ones that I um, have in my possession are either Japanese, and the Japanese floats tend to be made out of old sake bottle glass that's been melted down and reused, and they tend to be these kind of colors, more of a paler green, a paler blue. The Koreans and the Russians tend to have more of a teal, a brighter green, an ice blue, um, and you can differentiate between the floats. The Japanese do not use a mold. They free blow their floats. Then they put a blob, a piece of glass over the hole, and in the in you can see a, a nubbin inside. I don't know if you can see that very well. Let me see. See that nubbin? So you have a blob seal or a blob button, and then you have uh, the nubbin inside. Some people also call that the blob button. Um, a lot of people collect just based on the shape, the size of the, the nubbin inside. 
the Koreans and the Russians, let me find a Russian one here, um, they, the Koreans and the Russians use molded forms that the glass is blown into. So you're gonna find lines around it. And then the Koreans tend to mark theirs with numbers, sometimes with this sort of thing. The Russians, on the other hand, and I had a Russian float here somewhere, tend to use round circles to mark theirs. So that would be, my understanding is a Korean float. If I'm wrong, I'm sure someone will let me know. The Russians tend to have a rounder, a rounder stamp like this. So that's something to remember. Molded floats tend to be Korean or Russian. Hand-blown floats tend to be Norwegian, I think Portuguese, and definitely Japanese. So the floats I really prefer, the ones I love, are the ones that sh have been actually working floats. They were used by fishermen, and they show signs of wear and tear. What happens is, and I call these voyagers of hope, really. Uh, one of the first ones I found was the year after my mother died, and I was really blue. She was had been my best friend, and I was in, of all places, Honolulu, Hawaii, and it was a rainy day, and no one was around, and the waves were coming, and I actually write about it in my book, and I give you a little tutorial on floats here, and this float was bobbing out at sea. I saw it through the rain, surrounded by trash, and um, I thought, my God, what's that glistening thing in the water bobbing up and down? And I actually walked into the water with my clothes on, waist high, and I reached over, and there was this gift from the sea that came. Uh, what happens is these little floats are tied. A lot of them have macrame netting around them. Most of them do, and these are tied to bigger, bigger nets. And in the turbulence of the Pacific Ocean, particularly, they are ripped from the mother net, and then they flounder in the ocean, sometimes for decades, swirling around in these gyres forever until they finally beach somewhere. Many break, but some beach. And some of them, when they beach, they're, they're beaching in the middle of winter in a turbulent, windy times, and they roll, on the, they roll on the sand, so then they get sandblasted. And you'll see little ones like this. I call them jaguars just because of the spots. But they get sandblasted, and the net has stayed on it. It's almost like it's saying, I'll protect you. And when the netting finally blows off, you have these wonderful, wonderful little um, markings from the net hanging in there to protect it. Uh, or you get beautiful, beautiful sandblasted floats. This is an interesting one. Now, collectors would like this one because it has the indentation. One thing I neglected to tell you, which is interesting also, is some floats, the Koreans have their markings up here. The Japanese have their markings. Now, this might be hard to see. They have little kanji marks down here. So this is a way that you can trace. Here's one that says Z. This is not an uncommon marking. So there are books that are out that can help you trace these markings. If you want to learn more, Beachcombing for Japanese Glass Floats by Amos Wood is one of the all-time great books. I know you can get it at the Mo Clips Museum in Washington State right now over on Olympic Peninsula. This is where I got mine. These are hard copies to find, but they do have them. If you're interested in markings and tracing the identity of your floats, uh, Stu Farnsworth and Alan Rammer's Glass Fishing Floats is a wonderful book that will help you just go right to your pictures. I've, I've used it several times. See the dog ears? So I have floats that have some of these markings on them. Uh, the Glass Balls by Walt Pick is also one of the excellent all-time great books. Then lastly, if you want to learn more about Norwegian floats, and Norwegian floats cost a lot these days, but this fellow has written a wonderful um, uh, document on the history of them. www.bestnorwegian.com uh, has, he has written this wonderful uh, thing that he will send to you and you can download it. And then you have a wonderful um, document that will give you more information on the Norwegian floats. So that's it for today. Have a good time. I know many of you are social distancing. Here's a good research project for you. Happy combing!